Hello. Thank you very much. Merhaba. We are going to Turkey. And uh, I just love Turkey, and it's great to have an opportunity to share with you um, an hour of information about just a wonderful destination if you're dreaming about going to Europe. I'm Rick Steves, and for ever since I was a kid, I've been teaching people how to travel. I spend four months here in Europe, making all the mistakes, taking careful notes, hoping people can learn from my mistakes rather than their own and have a better trip. And I'll tell you, a great way to spice up your European adventure is to head out to Turkey, all right? This is where East meets West. And anybody going to Europe, I believe, should consider a trip over to Turkey. It's a great way to spice up your adventure. And when you go to Turkey, this is a chance for you to East meets West in a people-to-people -people kind of way. And a beautiful thing about traveling in Turkey is flat out the warm welcome you get. Turks love to meet Americans, and I can't think of a place where you get a warmer, more fun-loving, un, you know, uh, unpredictable, surprising, just memorable welcome as Turkey. It's where people meet people, it's where East meets West, and it's where the present meets the past. There's so much history in Turkey, and it's a chance for us to get up close and personal with it. Now, when we think of Turkey, it's about the size of Texas with about 70 million people, 90, 95, 98%, something in that range, are practicing Muslims. Uh, it is a modern, pluralistic, secular country, okay? Looking west. I know a lot of people are nervous about that part of the world, and there is reason to be nervous if you're going farther east to Syria or Iraq, obviously. True, Turkey borders all of the chaos in Syria and Iraq. Remember, though, this country is the size of Texas. And while I think eastern Turkey is fascinating, almost everything we're going to talk about today is in the western half of this map, okay? If you have a first look at Turkey, you are going to be visiting basically this. This is the tour we've been taking since before the first Gulf War. This is what I was doing as a student traveling around Turkey. And this is what I would recommend to you for the best two weeks in Turkey. Whether you're going to take one of our tours or whether you're going to use our itinerary and do it on your own, which is very reasonable, this is what I would focus on if you have two weeks. And this is what I'll be talking about in the next hour. We start in Istanbul. And then, in the old days, you'd take the night train over to Ankara, but these days, the train is uh, uh, faster than that, or you'd want to take the bus, or you'd actually fly. Most Turks just fly from point to point. It's cheap and easy to fly within Turkey. From Ankara, you would go into the heartland of central Turkey, and this is what we call Cappadocia, and then over to Konya, a very traditional part of, of Turkey, where Mevlana would have been, uh, is, is buried. And then down on the south coast, Antalya is a wonderful resort for a taste of the Mediterranean before cutting over to the west coast, enjoying some of the best ruins anywhere at Aphrodisias and Kusada in Ephesus, which is near the cruise port of Kusadasi. From Kusadasi, you can then catch a boat into the Greek Isles if you like. When we think about Turkey, we're thinking about a proud land that's not living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Okay, it's been a real rough go. Think of all the ch challenges around Turkey, and think of what a great thing it is for a country that was mired in medieval sort of um, uh, style of life and corruption and sultans and all of that until World War I. And then it was going to be carved up on the buffet line of European colonialism, and their great leader, Ataturk, rescued them from that, created a, uh, a modern country, and gave it a modern uh, secular constitution. When we go to Turkey today, we'll find a country that is proud, and it's proud of its separation of mosque and church as well or separation of mosque and state, just like we have a separation of church and state. For instance, I was traveling in eastern Turkey with uh, one of our tours once, and we had 25 people driving around, and in eastern Turkey, you don't have all the famous sites I'm going to be showing you in this uh, PowerPoint, and you're just looking for interesting things. In the shadow of Mount Ararat, we found a high school stadium filled with kids having a rally. We stopped the bus, like any good tour guide would, go in and see what's happening. 300 high school kids getting together, singing together in unison while thrusting their fist up in the sky. We are a secular nation. We are a secular nation. I asked my guide, what's going on here? Don't you people like God? And she said, oh, we love God. But considering the rising tide of Islamic fundamentalism just over our border to the east, we're very concerned about the precious and fragile separation of mosque 
and state here in our country given to us by Ataturk back in the 1920s when we became a modern pluralistic and secular society. It's tough to maintain that these days, can you imagine? And in Turkey there is a rising tide of fundamentalism. You could even imagine that here in the United States. I mean there's fundamentalism all over the place. The problem with fundamentalism is fundamentalists think they're right and everybody else is wrong. And if you live in a pluralistic society, that's not freedom. And uh, in Turkey they are determined to protect that fundamentalism even though it is a stress point within that culture. When you travel through Turkey, you will find all sorts of people action, culture action, uh, art action, proud artisans that love to show off. On one of our tours, I'll never forget coming into a village and meeting people like this. They had never met another American group. We met the mayor, he was proud, he took us to his house and we all danced like people do when they go to the mayor's house. And I was the, I was the tour guide, I'm the big shot, so the big shot, the mayor, pulls me over to the wall and he says, I want you to come over here. This is the most sacred place in my house. It is the place where I hang my Quran bag. In the Quran bag, I've got a copy of the Quran, a copy of the Torah, and a copy of the Bible, because I believe we're all children of the same God, people of the book. It's interesting to meet people, and you will meet people on the road if you get out and put yourself in an opportunity to meet people that aren't part of the tourist trade. Later on in that town, we visited the woodcarver. We all gathered around his desk in his workshop, and suddenly he stopped. After He was the most popular guy in the village. I mean, every town nearby wanted a prayer niche carved by this guy. We all gathered around. He was proud, carving, showing off. Suddenly he stopped. He held his chisel high into the sky, and he declared, a man and his chisel, the greatest factory on earth. Wow. I thought, I don't need to encourage this man to go to night school to get computer literate. He had it together. He was proud. He found his niche. He was fulfilled. When you travel, you meet people like that, and Turkey is the perfect opportunity for that. But you got to get a little bit out of your comfort zone if you're going to do that, and you can do that when you go to Turkey. I've got very good friends in Turkey who I've worked with for nearly 20 years. Tan and Lali, this is Lali, uh, Sermon Aran, and they co-author with me our guidebook on Istanbul, and they organize our tours, which we're very proud of, and Turkey is such a complicated place, I wouldn't even attempt it without local experts. But Lali is brilliant, you've seen her on our TV shows, and Lali helped, uh, well actually Lali and Tan spearheaded the writing of this book, uh, the Rick Steves Istanbul book. If you want any specifics on what I'm talking about with Istanbul, you'll want to rely on that book. Now, when we consider Istanbul, remember, Istanbul is the great, it's one of the top cities in Western civilization. If there's four cities in Europe that deserve a one-week visit, it would be London, Paris, Rome, and Istanbul. Istanbul is there with the other biggies, there's no doubt. It's no wonder that that's one of the few tours, cities in Europe that we do a one-week tour to, just to that city. For 400 years, Istanbul was the leading city in Christendom. When Western Europe was rutting in the mud, in the, you know, deep in the Dark Ages, it was Istanbul that was seen by Christians as the shining beacon of civilization so far away. Today we can see the remnants of that Byzantine civilization, the, the survivor of the western half of the Roman Empire, the eastern half of the Roman Empire, that morphed into the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and the great city today that has 12 or 13 million people in it. This is literally where east meets west, and today you will find the cultures coming together here. This is the, it's like geology and tectonic plates rubbing together. You got Islam and Christianity, Christendom, two great tectonic plates of culture, and where they come together, there's gonna be earthquakes and rubbing, and that's just the nature of the beast. And to go there and learn from it and talk to people is very rewarding. When you think about the great city of Istanbul, think of the general lay of the land. The Bosporus is the strait that separates Europe from Asia. And there on the far east, we see the Asian part of Istanbul. Millions of people in Istanbul live in Asia, and in the last couple of years, they've actually drilled a tunnel under the Bosporus, connecting Asia and Europe. Seattle right now is dr drilling a tunnel from 4th Avenue to 12th Avenue. <laughs> and I believe we're stuck about halfway there. The Turks have connected two continents. And it's a subway train now, uh, complementing all the ferries that go across as literally millions of people commute to work from Asia to Europe. On the European side, that's the historic side, 
you've got the Golden Horn. You might have heard of the Golden Horn. That's that bay of water that comes in there splitting historic Istanbul to modern Istanbul north of that. So you've got the Bosporus, a very narrow, busy strait, traffic jam of shipping going up to the Black Sea uh, from the Mediterranean, separating Asia and Europe. And then you've got the Golden Horn separating the historic city from the modern city. All the commotion and fun modern stuff is up in the north. And then on the south, you can see the Bosporus and the Golden Horn making a peninsula. If you're looking for a great capital that's easy to fortify, you got it here. All you got to do is build a wall across that little bit of land, and you got your naturally fortified peninsula where you'd find the historic core of Istanbul. And today, we look all through the historic area for your sightseeing and your shopping, and further inland, you've got the Great Wall, which is also fun to check out. Now, this is the Galata Bridge that connects the old town with the new town going right across the Golden Horn. This is the gateway to that Golden Horn. The Galata Bridge has long been kind of a community center as much as a bridge can be, and that's well worth focusing on in your trip. When you go to Istanbul, the skyline is not a bunch of church spires like we'd find in Europe, but it's a bunch of mosques with minarets. And there's one area where there are the mosques that you gotta check out. There's, there's lots of great mosques to see. And there's four or five that we recommend in our guidebook. For the purposes of today's brief talk, I'm just gonna talk about two. There's the Blue Mosque, which is the big hit for the tourist. It's right there on the main square. The main square is called the Hippodrome, a former, back in Roman times, this was a big, uh, it's kind of a race course area. Now it's got all sorts of monuments on it. It's a public marketplace kind of square with important historic buildings and museums all around it. You got the Blue Mosque, and it's important, and the number of minarets is an indication of how important it is, and you've got a lot of minarets there for a, a mosque, and when you approach the Blue Mosque, you'll find lots of locals going to worship, and you'll find lots of tourists who are welcome to go inside as long as they um, take off their shoes and cover women cover their hair. Uh, you've just got to have modesty code there like a church in Europe. You step inside, and you realize turquoise is the French word for color of the Turks. Turquoise, and you've got the Blue Mosque, which is actually lots of turquoise tiles. It's a beautiful interior, well worth checking out. Across the, the square from there is Hagia Sophia, and Hagia Sophia is the historic building, much more important than the Blue Mosque, historically. Uh, it, it, you have to pay to go into this one, the other one's free, uh, and this is more of a museum now. But this dome was a very important dome. The Romans built the Pantheon in about the year 200. It was 500 years later that the, uh, bi uh, the uh, Eastern the Byz Byzantines were able to build this dome. And that was the biggest dome in Western civilization until Brunelleschi built the dome in Florence in 1400. So Pantheon, Hagia Sophia, Brunelleschi's dome in Florence. 500 years apart, either, each one about, you know. And uh, when we look at this amazing dome, but remember that was originally a church, and then you have a Christian uh, civilization, it is overrun by a Muslim situation, and then the churches become mosques. The greatest church, what do you do? You just stick some minarets on it, and uh, inside you've got to redirect the prayer niche. Because Jerusalem is that way, and Mecca is that way. So instead of moving the whole church, you just scoot over the direction of prayer. If you look at the apse, the high altar, and you look at the prayer niche there, it's just a little bit to the right because that's the whole nature of praying towards your holiest place. Uh, inside, we've got beautiful, beautiful uh, Christian art covered up by beautiful, beautiful Muslim art. Where you would have beautiful statues and paintings, in Islam, of course, you do not have figures. You only have calligraphy and geometric designs and so on. So instead of a great painting of Jesus and Mary and Peter, you would have calligraphy with beautiful banners that will spell out Mohammed or whatever great Muslim character is going to be celebrated there. And that would be the same kind of purpose, but with the aesthetics of that religion. Remember, underneath the Muslim decor on these historic buildings that were Christian and then became Muslim, you have Christian, precious Christian art generally whitewashed over and today sometimes revealed. In front of the Hagia Sophia, you've got a great park and this wonderful Hippodrome Square, which has all sorts of antiquities. And even underneath it, you've got a cistern that goes back to ancient Roman times. This cistern reminds you that this was a grand city. As a matter of fact, when Rome was falling, remember, Rome lasts for a 1,000 years. 
500 BC to 500 AD. It grows for 500 years, peaks for 200 years, falls for 300 years. Well, when Rome starts falling, the emperor says, you know, we're riding a sinking ship. I think I'm going to jump off, and I'm going to move east where it's more stable. Emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor who legalized Christianity in the year 310 or something, he decided to vacate Western Rome and establish his Eastern Roman Empire in the city he decided to name Constantinople after himself. Constantinople then became the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Rome fell, and Constantinople lived on for centuries after that as the remnant of Rome, okay? And then Constantinople, Christian, remember the last 200 years of Rome were Christian, Byzantium was Christian, then the Ottomans came, they took over that civilization, you can imagine what happened. You had to become a, Christ, um, a Muslim, just like before you had to become a Christian. And they changed the name of the city, not named after a Christian emperor, but named Istanbul, which is uh, a, a word that is uh, a Muslim sort of slogan for the new culture. Uh, you go under the streets and you can find the infrastructure of ancient Rome, right there in Constantinople, the cistern which you can tour. Throughout the Muslim time, you had a grand palace. You had the Versailles in Europe, and you'd have big palaces in the Ottoman world, and this is the top copy palace. If you look at a model of it, it's just sprawling. It's very confusing. When you go inside, you'll find all sorts of beautiful um, loggias and beautiful squares and elegant living rooms, and you've got the infamous harem there, and you can learn all about that. And really, frankly, the way you got to understand that is reading the book, listening to the audio tour, or having a local guide. One reason I'm so enthusiastic about encouraging people to take our Turkey tours, if you want two weeks in Turkey, you want to understand what's going on, you want to get into the mayor's house, you want to do the dancing, you want to meet the wood carver, you want to stop and see the kids having that pep rally for secular, secularity, you know, uh, you really need a local guide. And I think you accomplish a third more in a given amount of days with a local Turkish guide. We would not do our Turkey tours with an American guide. That's the only country where I think you got to have a local guide. Speaks the language, is Muslim, understands that culture, can get doors open, can really navigate you through the choppy waters of touring in Anatolia. We always like to have an American going along, uh, but our Turkish guides are great. I have taken my mom and dad, I've taken my loved ones, my family, my best friends on our Turkey tour. It's the one tour I'm really personally committed to. I really think it's important for Americans to have some time in a moderate, western-looking, secular, pluralistic Muslim society. Because there's a billion Muslims on this planet, and there's about a couple thousand warriors in ISIS, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, that's a serious problem, but we've got to remember, Islam is a billion people. There's a thousands and thousands of crackpots in Christendom too, right? And, and, and you really want to go to a moderate Muslim country. When my daughter did her post-graduation trip around Europe, the last thing I wanted her to do was spend a week in, is, in Istanbul so she could see a modern, secular, Islamic nation, and she was thankful she did. Uh, that's, again, why I'm really encouraging people to either hire a local guide or take our tour. We've been doing our tours without a hitch since before the first Gulf War. I just took it myself. After co-leading it eight or ten times, just two years ago, I took the tour myself, because and I just wanted to enjoy the guide and have all those experiences again. I took it as a participant. If you don't take our tour, you can hire local guides at the Top Copy Palace, in the market, at the Grand Bazaar, for the cruise up the Bosporus. And the great news is, a guide in Turkey is twice as helpful as a guide in England for one quarter of the cost. <laughs> you don't need a guide in Edinburgh or, or, or London or, or Bath. You need a guide in Istanbul or Konya or, or uh, Ankara. And with a guide, you sit down and you learn about the Top Copy Palace. There's lots of good guides. They're hardworking. They speak great English. They're scrambling, and they're all yours for a very reasonable price. Then you go out to the Cora Church, and you can understand a great center of Christian art buried in the middle of thriving Istanbul. And you go in there and you see centuries-old pieces of, of, uh, of uh, symbolism and mosaic and gold leaf, and, and you understand what was it like for Christians back then? What was it like when the Muslims came? And on and on. In big, bustling Istanbul, there's one tram line. And it is always crowded, and it, I'd say it's a godsend. It's how you get from the modern city, Texum Square, all the way over to the Blue Mosque, and then on to the Grand Bazaar. That's your spine. Hop on, hop off of that tram. 
Some people are going to be worried, oh, it's too crowded, you're going to get pickpocketed. Well, it's very crowded, but uh, as long as you're reasonably buttoned up and wearing your money belt, there's nothing dangerous about it. I feel comfortable in Istanbul, but remember, you're relatively wealthy, and if there are any thieves, it's not because the country is thief-ridden, it's just because it's common sense for a thief to target an American in Turkey, because we got all the money. So just be on guard. When you are using the transit and so on, remember there's a modern infrastructure and it behooves us to be proactive and confident and imagine that it works and it's explained in English. As a matter of fact, if you look carefully at the signs on this machine that sells the tokens for the tram, you'll see that the signs are in two languages. One in Turkish for the locals and one in English for everybody else. We are lucky we get to use our language for everybody else. Now, when you cross from the old city into the newer part of town, you walk across the Galata Bridge, and you see the famous Galata Tower up above. Here is where the cruise ships park. Every day, there's two to four, five, six uh, cruise ships there. Each one has two or 3,000 people on it. That's a lot of tourists dumping into the city, all going to the same places, following their p ping pong paddle numbered guides, you know? And uh, uh, I just think it's a phenom. And I'll tell you, I went to Istanbul on a cruise ship, and I loved it. It is such an incredible harbor to cruise through. When you're going out of that harbor, the city goes forever, and you see it from the top deck of your boat. I mean, it's a 10, 12, 14 million people. Who can count them? And uh, when you dock right here, you're right in the center of town. I will never forget being on top of this uh, ship for, l for breakfast at 8 o'clock. 9 o'clock, I hit the ground. I went up to the top of this, and I was just immersed in the wonder of that amazing city. Right there, this is 10 o'clock in the morning after a relaxing breakfast on the cruise, and here there's not a hint of the cruise, is there? It's me and a sea of Turkish people thriving in an everyday shopping day in Istanbul. This is the main drag in downtown Istanbul, Eskadal Kadase. And this is this busy all day long until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. There's a tram, there's a trolley line right under all those feet, and the trolley can generally not go because it's just too crowded. There you can see the trolley at an off moment. But just to walk down that street aimlessly, I mean, it's a couple miles long, and just to walk it is one of the most beautiful experiences I can imagine traveling anywhere in Europe. It's, you don't need famous sites, you're just, it's just a cultural carnival. You can taste, you can photograph, you can experience, you can joke, you can gamble, you can do all sorts of fun things in the streets there as you explore. It culminates at Taksim Square, which has a great cultural center named for Ataturk. And in the center of Taksim Square, there is a big monument to Ataturk. And uh, uh, Ataturk is the George Washington of, uh, of uh, Turkish culture. He's the man, the superpower, as far as political make it happen goes, that took Turkey out of the Middle Ages and into the modern world in the 1920s, after World War I. And you'll see a lot about him in your travels. Shoppers love the Grand Bazaar. And non-shoppers love the Grand Bazaar. The Grand Bazaar is just a cultural must-see and do. This is the square in front of it. You step inside, and it's literally thousands of shops. And it was, uh, the, there's an amazing history to it. There's a labyrinthine floor plan. There's all sorts of different zones where you can see some sort of a crude kind of Wall Street and currency exchange going on. You can see all the leather souk. You can see the goldsmiths. And you can see, you know, the fruit stalls and, and the leather shops. And it's just an amazing place to explore. I never get tired of the Grand Bazaar. And I just like to clown around with the merchants and uh, take photographs. And with a good guidebook, we have a guided tour of the Grand Bazaar, get a cultural understanding out of the place as well as just browsing and random shopping. Nearby is a place called the Spice Market, and it's just another bazaar, and it's very popular with tourists, and it's very colorful, and it's fun to visit that. One of the highlights for me when I'm in Istanbul is to check out its medieval ramparts, the Ottoman ramparts. They are the most incredible wall you know, protecting the whole city, going from the Bosporus on one side to the Golden Horn on the other, Bosporus and Golden Horn, then providing sort of a three-quarters moat around the most important city uh, in its day. And uh, you can actually climb along the wall. We've got a tour along the wall in our Istanbul guidebook that's narrated, and it makes for a beautiful walk, and it drops you off in a very characteristic neighborhood. It's so important to get away from the tourist zone and actually get out there where the people live and play some backgammon and connect with the locals. On the Golden Horn, there's a dock with all sorts of boats, and these boats are eager and desperate 
to take you on a cruise. It's cheap, it's competitive, enjoy letting people bargain for, everybody wants your money, of course. You know, it's just your classic developing world sort of market scene. And you wander around and find out what the going rate is. It's just entertainment, it's, it's, it's sport to let people try to get you on board and give you a better and better price. Then you got your one hour or your two hour or your three hour cruise, whatever you like, and you enjoy the magnificent Bosporus Strait heading all the way up towards the Black Sea, which is the gateway to Russia. Okay, now we are ready to leave Istanbul. And by the way, there is a, a European part of this Texas-sized si country, and there's not a lot to do in the European part of Turkey except for Istanbul for a first trip. Of course, there is endless stuff you can see and do around Turkey, and I was just thinking before the talk how scanty my coverage is. But for the first two weeks in Turkey, I'm covering what you, I would say, with my experience, you should be focused on. Again, we're going to go now from Istanbul to the modern capital, Ankara. And Ataturk moved the capital to Ankara because he wanted to be proudly Turkish, Anatolian, not the Istanbul window on the west. For the same reason, St. Petersburg in Russia is the window on the west. Moscow is the Russian city, you see. Istanbul is the window on the west. Ankara would be more the Anatolian heartland. Uh, that's the modern capital today, and it's a huge city, many millions of people in Ankara, and it's your look at cosmopolitan Turkey. I like going to Ankara, if for nothing else, than to experience cosmopolitan, big, thunderous, urban Turkey, No, nothing cute for the tourists. Uh, the big deal when you go around, again, this, you're going to follow what we do with our tours now. This is exactly our tour route. This is the route I took my film crew on last year, and we made two new shows on Turkey covering exactly this. You can visit that on my website at ricksteves.com. We have four shows covering Turkey. That's two hours of information, one show on Istanbul, one on central Turkey, one on western Turkey, and one on eastern Turkey. If you look at those two hours, that's a lot of information. You can get the scripts, and you can use that as a basis for your adventure. Ankara, the centerpiece, is the mausoleum of Ataturk. And this is your Washington Memorial and your Jefferson Memorial put together, along with Mount Rushmore, okay? It's everything. And people just cannot get enough of Ataturk. He's buried in this mausoleum. And when you think about the impact Ataturk had on Turkey, he is, I know they have a moment of silence every year for the minute that he died. I've got friends who, when they were young girls, they never thought they could fall in love because they loved the father of their country so much. I've got another friend who, whose father died of a heart attack during the moment of silence for Ataturk. Other people see Ataturk up in the clouds, you know. It's got, this guy has a huge impact on Turkey, and it's just hard for us to even fathom how important one man can be for a modern country. But for Turkey to be independent and secular and pluralist is like a minor miracle. And uh, given all the chaos over there, and think of what Western powers have done to places like Iraq, creating countries that shouldn't exist, and all the, the tumult because of that. Turkey has held its own. Turkey is, uh, has, has this many empires uh, on top of each other, and today Turkey is working very hard to maintain it. And it's a brilliant story. It's a, it's a heart-wrenching story. It's a very difficult challenge. And when we go to Ankara and we go to the mausoleum of Ataturk, we can see the feeling that Turks have for the father of their country, a wonderful, powerful museum there celebrating the creation of Turkey. And from there, it's a very short bus ride or taxi ride to get to the museum, which is the Anatolian Civilizations Museum. And here's where you can go way, way back. Because the Hittites and all sorts of prehistoric civilizations were here, the Fertile Crescent, you know, the Mesopotamia, all of these very roots of, of, uh, of uh, our human history are in this part of the world. And a lot of times they say the more they dig, the more they find that Anatolia, rather than Mesopotamia, is the uh, birthplace of civilization. Whatever, you know, Mesopotamia would be the Tigris and Euphrates River that goes through Iraq. Uh, Anatolia can rival that in its an antiquities, and you got the very best artifacts from all of those digs in Ankara in that great museum. If you want to see one museum to prepare you for the countryside and your sightseeing, that would be the one to see. Turkey is big. Turkey has a lot of people. And Turkey has great transportation. Miserable train transportation, wonderful bus transportation, and wonderful cheap flights. You can fly anywhere in Turkey. And if you think flying might be dangerous in a country like Turkey, it's far safer than taking the bus. 
I mean, you're going to be moving around in a little bit of chaos. I'd much rather fly. Now, really, you know, there's statistically, you're just every bit as safe in Turkey as you are in, in Europe when it comes to flying. And the airfare is super cheap, and people commute without thinking about it flying around Turkey. Consider that. But also remember that the buses are super comfortable, and they go every hour in every direction from every town. They're dirt cheap. I find they're very comfortable. And I question why anybody would rent a car when you can relax and let somebody else do the driving. And you can complement that with little minibus rides and taxi rides as you travel around the country. Your stop going south from Ankara is Cappadocia. And Cappadocia is on everybody's list for good reason. It's this fairy chimney wonderland. You've got all of these erosion pinnacles where you, know, you have a harder rock on top, and over the centuries, the erosion makes the pinnacle smaller and smaller until it all tumbles down. There are huge underground cities built into these rocks, like we think of some of the Indian uh, Native American uh, settlements in southwest United States. Uh, you can go there and visit these national parks. Nobody lives in these parks anymore. And you can literally crawl through all of those homes and get upstairs and downstairs and around the corner. Uh, they're, they're just fantasy areas to explore. And a lot of them are very historic with old churches that go back to early Christian times. And when you go to these old churches, you'll find they were sort of hiding out, so they kept a low profile, and they built their churches in caves instead of uh, uh, out in the open, because that's just asking for trouble in this area where bad guys are roaming around back and forth. So they'd hide in valleys, but inside these caves, they would have remarkable uh, art, and they would paint the stones, so it looked like there were, uh, you know, bricks or stones that are carved out and everything, and it just feels like a Western church in a cave in the middle of Turkey. And then you'll look at this precious art that goes back to early Christian times, and you'll see it all, the faces are chiseled out. And this is what happens with art, religious art, when one group comes by. Christians will come by and deface the Muslim stuff. Muslims will come by and deface the Christian stuff. Protestants will come by and deface the Catholic stuff and Sunnis will come by and deface the Shiite stuff. It's just, God help you if you're religious art in this part of the world, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to go in there, and you see these gorgeous pieces of art that are so precious and so old, and see some, you know, fanatic just scribble out the face, it's really heartbreaking. But it's quite a privilege to be able to actually see it. There's an underground city called Kaimakli, and we filmed there just last summer, and this is one of our cameramen here, Dean. And uh, we went, it goes down like four or five stories, and thousands of people would live underground with ventilation shafts, and, and it's just incredible to think that entire communities were hiding out here, living underground, while bad guys were running around upstairs. Uh, you can visit that. You can climb through it. It's one of the highlights of going to Cappadocia. Another of the highlights is to meet with people. Now, if you take a tour, you know, it's easy. This is Mine, and she was my guide when I took our tour, because Mine was leading us for two weeks around Turkey, and we came to a little town, and she has a friend who's a matriarch in this town who loves to invite people into her home, and with Mine, we'd come in, and we'd talk, and we, she would serve us a nice meal, and then we would be able to sit around and ask her questions, and ask her children questions about what life is like around here, what are they concerned about that, what do they see in the future, what are their stress points, what makes them happy, what makes them threatened, all of these fascinating looks into the the culture, we can get because we have a local guide that connect, ca can connect us. You got to remember, this is a scrambling economy, and in every one of these towns, there are local guides that would love to work for you. You can hire them, they'll be your uh, expert, your private expert, and then you'll be able to sit down in somebody's home, enjoy the local hospitality, have lunch, and have a back and forth. With our groups, we really got into the baggy pants, and we bought baggy pants. <laughs> I'll never forget, we went to the market and we all bought these fun baggy pants. And um, then we walked through the town in our baggy pants and all the kids were looking at us and like we were kind of idiots. And then <laughs> later on I realized, or they told me, these, these are pants that women wear, not men. <laughs> <laughs> so they're probably still talking about that American tour group that, that came by in the baggy pants. But I'm willing to make a few cultural faux pas just for the love of getting into those communities, getting into those markets, getting into the tea houses, and having a good time with the locals. Um, again, I, I joined the tour. I used to help lead the tour for many, many times because I'm so committed to the Turkey tour that we offer. And uh, two years ago, I just took the tour. One of the things I really can't put in the tour promotion literature is 
great people to travel with, but I take one of our tours every year as a participant these days. I've done that for the last 10 years, and I just flat out love the kind of people I get to hang out with who sign up for the tours. Because of the way we promote the tours, I think we attract a fun-loving group of people, and it just makes a huge difference in how much you enjoy the tour, because you're eating with these people and hiking with them and learning with them and staying out at night with these people, and it just is a lot of fun. So uh, if you're curious about a tour, uh, you know, you can dig into our website and learn more about the, the kind of people that join us and the kind of fun we have and, and the passion that our guides have for helping Americans enjoy maximum experience for every mile, minute, and dollar in their precious vacation time. One of the highlights of the tour for me was something I've never done anywhere else is ride a balloon. I've done it twice in Anatolia, and I'll tell you, if there's any place that you're going to fork over 200 bucks to ride in a balloon, it should be Cappadocia. And they don't go unless the weather's good, and you don't know until you get there. So you're going to get up at 4 o'clock and drive over to the place, and at 5.30 they're going to let you know if the weather goes. And then if it's a go, you and your partners get in this balloon, and I'm, I've never hang glided or anything like that. I won't tandem parasail or anything. I don't, if God wanted me to fly, he would have given me wings. Uh, but um, I did this, and I was so comfortable in it. It's just like we're sitting in this basket, and I'm like right here, and suddenly it's off the ground, and it just felt very stable. And then momentarily, we're gliding through this countryside over these very chimneys. And our guide is pointing out stuff down below. And then when it's all done, the guide actually landed our basket right on his trailer. We all got out, had a glass of champagne, and uh, said goodbye. It was a beautiful experience like that. So, you know, it's an option, and if you're going to go on a balloon anywhere, it's expensive, but uh, this is one place where it really does make sense from a uh, experience point of view. We came back a year later with the TV crew, and it was some of the most glorious filming we've ever done. In Cappadocia, the places I was just showing you are quite touristy, and obviously it's nice to have touristy zone because then you've got restaurants that, are com that you'd be comfortable in, and you've got comfortable uh, hotels and connections and English guide tours and all this. But you do want, when you get this far away, you want to take it one step further and go to a place where there are not many tourists. And you can find these kind of places on your own. This is what I do for a living, is venture off the beaten path and find these magic, what I call, back doors. And we drive to a place called Guzelyurt, which means beautiful town. And I found this place 20 years ago, and we take our groups here. And I just absolutely love Guzelyurt because it's a chance just to hang out with the locals. And uh, if you see a couple cute guys sitting on a bench, you can join them and uh, share a cup of tea and uh, really play backgammon. Uh, one thing I do every day when I'm in Turkey is go to a tea house and challenge a local to a game of backgammon. Learn how to play. It's not that tough. Same rules here as over there. And even if you don't know how to play, if you just sit down and challenge a local guy in a tea house to a game of backgammon, you just fake it, and if you don't move right away, other people will move for you. <laughs> because everybody's going to gather around. This is big news. There is some gawky person, a tourist from America, that's sitting down and playing Mustafa. And if the American ever wins, especially if it's a woman, Mustafa will never live that down, OK? <laughs> so by the way, when you think about men and women, uh, in Turkey, it's a Muslim country. It's a country that is more conservative than it has been in the past, and more people are wearing scarves. Wearing a scarf is not a defeat. Wearing a scarf is modest, it's respectful, it's sensitive. It behooves you, if you're a woman in a Muslim country, even a modern secular Muslim country, to wear a scarf when you're out and about, if, if you want to feel like the locals. and. Uh, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I've been, I was just in Palestine at the university talking to women there about why some of them wear scarves and some of them don't. And they choose to wear a scarf or not. They don't have to. And a lot of Muslim women just think they get more respect out on the streets when they're wearing a scarf. People are less likely to leer at them, and they don't like the thought of men leering at them, you see. Uh, we have the same kind of issues here. You wouldn't re dress in a, in a very racy uh, outfit if you're going on certain occasions, just like in Turkey. When you're out and about in public, a woman dresses modestly because in Islam, women are respected in a different way. It's a big story. I don't want to defend the horrible things that happen to women in Islam, but I'll tell you, Muslims look at our culture and they just think of some hot babe dressed in a miniskirt on a revolving platform at a car show selling hot rods. Because that's what we do with women, is we sex up the car sales, you see. And uh, that, to them, is disrespectful to women. That objectifies a woman's body. 
For us, it's just common sense advertising. <laughs> so don't let somebody condemn the, uh, the essence of how Muslims respect women. You could debate all sorts of other stuff, but there, it's a complicated issue. You know, a lot of Americans are down on Muslims because the men and the women don't worship together in the mosque. How do Muslims pray? They bend down and they stick their bottoms way up in the air. If you're a man in the back row of a jazzercise class trying to think about God, <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> this is a simple, practical matter. Because of the way people pray, you cannot have a woman in front of a man or the man's going to have a worthless experience. <laughs> so the w and by the nature of things, men always get the best seats. I mean, that's the way it is in our society, and that's the way it is in their society. The women are on the side. I mean, that's not fair. That's not right. We have evolved a little more than some other societies. When I travel in Islam, I try to remember different societies are on parallel tracks as they evolve. We've had the Enlightenment. We've had the Reformation. We've had the French Revolution. We've had Vatican II, we've had a lot of things, and other societies are still waiting for those things. But before we had all of that, we were just as regressive and old-fashioned as some of the societies we're anxious about. We've got to let people evolve, I believe, in their own terms. If we force them along, that builds up a resistance and it becomes negative, it becomes counterproductive. I know it takes a lot of patience, but if you enjoy history, and I enjoy history, you realize that, hey, a hundred years ago, we were a lot different than where we are right now. Think of the change in a hundred years, and a hundred years is nothing. We got to give Islam another hundred years before we go over there and tell them how to treat their women. Uh, I, I just think it's important for us to let them grow in the modern way on their terms. And when you travel in Turkey, you can see a society doing a great job, doing a valiant job at figuring that out. Go to the tea houses, play backgammon, get to know people, sit on the floor in the mosque and talk with the imam after the prayer service. You can do this. Get yourself invited into a party all over the place. There's music, there's dancing. You'll find yourself a guest of honor at a wedding. Take advantage of it. Drop the appointment to go to the palace, to go to the museum, and party with the locals. You'll be going around the countryside. You'll see little boys dressed up like, like generals and, and admirals. These are circumcision festivals. And circumcision is something that is not the ugly thing you think of as in mutilation in Africa. Circumcision is just a coming of age that nearly all boys have in Turkey, just like so many guys have had in the United States. And here, it's a big festival. It's in fact, it's called the wedding without the in-laws. It's even considered more fun, <laughs> more fun than a wedding. And you'll find in the countryside music and dancing and little boy danced, dressed up and he comes into, into the party on a horse. And everybody gives him, pins money onto his outfit, and it's a big deal, and then his moment comes, and he goes into the house, and the party carries on, and, and uh, he comes out a man, you see. So that's just, um, uh, it's a cultural thing, and you'll find all sorts of festivals, whether they are weddings or circumcisions or who knows what, that you can be a part of. Go into the markets. In the markets, have fun with your camera. Buy things, taste things, get to know people. There's so much fun in the markets everywhere you go in Turkey. A lot of times you'll find yourself sitting on carpets. When you're sitting on a carpet, remember, that's part of the culture. And people are making carpets. It's a cottage industry. You can buy these carpets everywhere you go. Uh, it's a big touristy thing. Most tourists end up paying way too much for their carpets, and it's still a good deal. I mean, I've bought many carpets over there. I like to go to the places where they're making the carpets, and then I like to go to the big carpet shops where you get the whole treatment. And you sit down, and they roll out 30 carpets, and they give you all sorts of local wine, beer, and tea, and chai, and all this kind of stuff. And ultimately, if you're like me, you're going to buy that carpet. And now it's one of my, f it's my favorite souvenir. It's in my hallway at home. Uh, but you've got a chance to buy a carpet, whether it's from a big fancy outfit, which will mail it home for you, and everything's guaranteed, or you can buy it from some peasant in a village that just has a dusty old thing that's not even square that they'd love to change for a couple hundred dollars. So it's fun to have that opportunity and bring back that souvenir. Konya is one of the most traditional, considered old-fashioned and r regressive cities by a lot of modern Turks, but this is a very, very religious place, Konya, and it is the home of Mevlana. Mevlana, more commonly known, I think, as Rumi. He's a poet of love. And when you go to Turkey, you'll find a lot of whirling dervishes. You'll see a lot of whirling dervishes, not because there's a lot of whirling dervishes, because you're a tourist, and they're going to put them on the stage at dinner. 
right? It's just cruise ship entertainment. I think it's important to remember, a whirling dervish is not entertainment for a photo op. It is a monk who's praying. And you've got to remember that apart from all of the glitzy whirling dervish shows a tourist will see. As a tour guide, I wanted my groups to meet a dervish and understand him. So I had the chance to meet a dervish and talk him into letting us watch him while he prays. And this is a demonstration I always like to give in my travel as a political act talk because it's a reminder of how our travels can make somebody who seems scary and almost crazy to look at much more real and less scary and, and logical. And you come home then with a broader perspective. But I met this dervish, and I said, hi, I'm a tour guide. I got 20 Americans. Can we come and watch you whirl? I didn't say it quite like that, but I'll just paraphrase here. And he said, I'm not a photo op. I'm a monk. But if you want to watch me pray, I'll let you, but I want you to know what I'm doing. So I'll explain first. I said, great. When and where? On my rooftop. Sundown. Okay, we're up there on a rooftop. He comes, he's got his outfit on, and he, we all gather around, and he says, I'm a dervish. That's the equivalent of a monk for you Christians. I follow the prophet Mevlana. He's a prophet of love, like your St. Francis. Easy to get your brain around. Everybody loves Mevlana. Five times a day, I get myself into a meditative trance by whirling, and I meditate on the teachings of my prophet Mevlana. I plant one foot in my home with my family, my hometown. The other foot goes around to celebrate and acknowledge the great variety in God's great creation. One hand goes up to accept the love of our maker, and the other hand, like the spout of a tea kettle, goes down and showers God's love on my family, on my hometown, and in all the beautiful diversity on this great planet that he blessed us with. And five times a day, I lose myself in the teachings of my prophet Mevlana. I become a conduit of the great prophet of love, connecting God with the people on earth. And I watched that man, his head tilted over, his robe billowed out, as he lost himself in that beautiful thought. And then I watched my tourists, and I saw the wonder on their faces, and I thought, this is good travel. And this is really the beauty of going to Turkey and humanizing a different faith. And then we can go home and better understand that little slice of Turkish culture. Now, when you travel farther south, you'll get to the Mediterranean coast, and this is a region with lots of tourism, lots of mass tourism, lots of Russians coming down there to take Mediterranean cruises. Antalya is the best single resort down there, Antalya. And from there, it's, uh, it's just a lively town, a fun town to check out. When you're in a town, there's lots of fun things to eat on the streets, lots of interesting photographs to take, lots of opportunities to go into a Turkish bath, a hammam. Everybody, I think, should get their courage up and go into a Turkish bath. You can go into touristy ones, you can go into local ones, your guidebook will explain. By the way, I don't cover Turkey outside of Istanbul. My favorite guidebook is Lonely Planet's Guide to Turkey. I love the Lonely Planet Guidebook to Turkey. One reason I haven't written a guidebook to Turkey is because I think the Lonely Planet Guide is so good. We cover Istanbul beautifully in the Rick Steve style that a lot of people like. Going beyond Istanbul, take advantage of that Lonely Planet book. It will list the different baths. Wonderful hotels. This is, uh, you know, with our tours, we, this is one of our tour groups checking into our pension in Antalya. Some of the hotels are just big, venerable, old business class hotels that feel like the 1960s. Other places are, are more cozy and charming, but you'll find plenty of comfortable rooms in Turkey. In fact, I think Turkey is overbuilt from a hotel's point of view. It's easy to find good rooms with comfortable surroundings, nice swimming pools, great dinners, and so on. Wonderful hospital welcome, hospitable welcome in a uh, economic price range while you're in Turkey. When it comes to eating in Turkey, I want to remind you that uh, the fun thing about Turkish food is you get to see what you're going to eat. If you have any question, just let them know you want to see, and they'll take you into the kitchen. Or generally, it's just right there on the buffet line, and you can see oh, some of that, some of that. Can I try a little bit of this? And you cobble together the meal. The nice thing about Turkey is you won't spend much money because this is Turkey, not France or Germany. Uh, beautiful fresh seafood, wonderful meze, little dishes that you can enjoy family style, lots of grilled vegetables, stuffed vegetables, stuffed peppers. I never get tired of eating in Turkey. There are so many things in Turkey that are fun about traveling there, and one of them is the constant festival of food that you're eating from breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and munching on the streets between meals. When you're in a resort on the Mediterranean, a big deal is hopping on a boat and going on a Mediterranean cruise, just a four-hour cruise. Or a three-hour cruise, I suppose we would say. And uh, we do that with our tours all the time. We just hire a traditional boat, 
and it's got lots of deck space and lots of sunbathing and lots of swimming, and uh, it's just a delightful afternoon out. Of course, you'll have some food, you'll have some backgammon, you'll drop the hook and do some swimming, and then you'll drive on farther west in Turkey. Pamukkale is one of the big poster sites in Turkey. Pamukkale is famous for its calcified mineral springs. There's hot springs there full of minerals. These minerals harden and create these pools. And at sunset, it's just dramatic. All these terraced pools. It's right next to an ancient site called Herapolis. People came here to die. It was a, a mythical, mystical kind of necropolis. And today, you can tour the ancient site. You can wander among the mineral springs. And you can even go to a spa and bathe with ancient columns. It's like champagne, fizzy water and you've got these ancient columns that you're standing on and broken statues, and you just feel like you're connecting with the history and the beautiful terrain of Turkey. One of my favorite ancient sites is a place called Aphrodisias, named after the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite. It was an important city in Greek times. It remained important through Roman times. It happened to be built on a fault line, so it had a lot of problems with earthquakes, and finally an earthquake around the year 700 made it uninhabitable. But today, when you go to Aphrodisias, you will find some of the most beautiful, elegant um, remaining uh, temples. Uh, and when you see a temple like this, you can assume it was knocked down in an earthquake and put back up in modern times. Uh, you can walk the main street. You can go to the museum. And I'll tell you, all over the ancient world, whether you're in Egypt or Greece or Turkey, you will find ancient sites, and thankfully, the art treasures have been brought out of the acidic air and put into state-of-the-art museums where you will have them preserved, described, and displayed comfortably in an air-conditioned interior. Uh, this is a real blessing, and when you're at any ancient site in Turkey, make time and pay the money to go into the museum as well as to rummage through the actual ancient site. A highlight of Aphrodisias for me is the stadium. This stadium, imagine, goes back like 2,000 years, and it was built to uh, have 30,000 fans come in. And this is, uh, this. I just have this shot in here to show you what it's like in the fall after a hot summer when it's all burned off, and what it's like in the spring when it's not all burned off. We were filming there, and I was scouting in the fall, it was like this, and I was filming in the spring, and it was like that. So it's nice to go in the spring because it's a hot, arid climate. Remember, Turkey is uh, very humid and hot on the coast, and then it's a high plateau. It can be very cold in the off-season in the interior, and it can be very hot and dry in the summer. It's vast in the spring. It's just a festival of flowers and greenery, and in the fall, it is more burned off. The main port on the west is Kusadasi. And Kusadas is famous because it was very smart in building a giant cruise harbor a long, long time ago before cruising became such a big deal. And today, it's the number one Turkish port outside of Istanbul. And uh, you'll find big cruise ships parking there all the time. And uh, I really love it as a cruise stop because it's, it's a great town in its own right. Great shopping, great Turkish baths, great harbor front, great restaurant scene. And from there, you're just half an hour away from Ephesus and the Virgin Mary's home, and lots of great ancient sites. Now, when you get off your big cruise ship, remember, it's, uh, uh, you can have a choice. When you get off of the cruise ship, there's here in, in Kusarashi, there's literally a sign that says, most tourists go to the left, and that's where you're going to catch your bus because you paid for the organized tour. Independent-minded tourists go to the right. You're on your own. Good luck. Don't miss the boat. You can imagine, at every port, they want to make money off you by selling you those optional tours, right? And you will just be shuttled right into the organized buses, and they do all their thing, and they get back to the bus on time. You're more than welcome to do your own thing. That's why I wrote my guidebook to Mediterranean cruise ports, and it works really well. And for the cost of going to the left and two people booking that bus tour, you can almost hire your own private guide with a car. And that's just for the more adventurous people. But right here, if you go to the right, you're going to find a fence. And behind the fence, there will be 10 guides with somebody's name on them, each holding up a name. And they have arranged through email to meet somebody off of the cruise ship. And those people have a private guide, and they get a more intimate experience. So the choice is yours. Remember, when a cruise ship books a guide, they're not paying the guide to show you around. The guides bid for an opportunity to take that group around because they're going to take them shopping and get kickbacks on the carpets. Right? It seems like a tour, but their primary thing is to take you shopping. Four carpets. 
I've heard, I don't know for sure, but I've heard while I was there that the buses provided to the cruise ships are given for free by the carpet shops with a driver. And then you know you're going to see Ephesus, you're going to see the Virgin Mary's house, and you're going to go to a carpet shop. <laughs> and if you got to skip something, it's not going to be the carpet shop. <laughs> So you're going to stop by that carpet shop, and as a rich American tourist with only one stop in Turkey, you have no idea what the going price is. You have no opportunity to shop around. You're going to buy your carpet there. That's the racket. You're going to blow extra hundreds of dollars. It's still exciting, but you got to know what's going on. And you got to know, when you go into Kusadasha, every glitzy shop pays tens of thousands of dollars to the various cruise lines to get a decal in their window that says, endorsed by this cruise line. Do your shopping here. I don't know how much that deals with quality or how much it deals with kickbacks. You can decide on that yourself. But as a shopper, you should be careful that the stakes are high and everybody's out for your extra dollar on your vacation. I've written this cruise port book. It works great. And when you're cruising around the Mediterranean, there are two important stops in Turkey. Kusadashi to visit Ephesus and Istanbul, two of the greatest, greatest sites in all of Europe. So it's a really exciting part of your cruising. The only place where the cruise ship spends two days on any cruise I've seen in the Mediterranean is Istanbul. It deserves two days. So you get that extra time there. You'll have enough time to do Ephesus from Kusadashi. It's, one of the, it's the only place in Turkey where I've made one of my self-guided audio tours. On my Rick Steves Auto Europe app, there is a self-guided tour to Ephesus, which is one of my favorite tours around. Ephesus, one of my favorite ancient sites. It's a Greek city, but it was most famous as a Roman city. This is the city where Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, the people of Ephesus. And here we have the great library of Ephesus, the main drag leading down to the library, lined with important temples, the theater. And the theater, you can just imagine all the people gathering here. When Paul said, you don't need to buy those little statues of Artemis, you don't need those gods, those pagan gods, just believe in the word of uh, the one God or whatever, you know. Uh, well, that was a pretty racy thing to say when you're going to cause everybody to stop buying the statues of Artemis. And the guys who made the statue of Artemis saw that they were going to be unemployed and all the status quo business ef efforts got against Paul and he had to leave town and then write his letter to the Ephesians instead of staying there and telling them. But you can, I can just picture the stadium filled of people saying, great is Artemis, great is Artemis. Paul, you get out of here, we're going to run you out of town, you see. So uh, there's all of that interesting footsteps of Paul history in this part of Iona. That's what it was called in ancient times, Iona, the west coast of Turkey. Also, at Ephesus, you've got the terraced houses, some of the most sumptuous excavations of the last generation, rich people's homes, terraced right up the hill with glorious ancient mosaics and well worth checking out. You know, lots more information is on our website. I've got a lot of information in Turkey just because I love Turkey. There's nine years of radio interviews lined up in our radio archives, plenty on Turkey there. We've got four TV shows on Turkey, lots of articles on, on Turkey, and it's all free, and you can check it out at ricksteves.com. I also want to remind you that you can follow me on Facebook. I just love uh, connecting with people on Facebook. I've got about a quarter million people that follow me on Facebook, and that gives me the impetus to really have a fun, behind-the-scenes, candid take on everything we're doing at Rick Steves Europe. So if you want to travel with me as we're making the guidebooks, making the TV shows, and putting our tours together, uh, follow us on Facebook and uh, visit our website. Remember that every year we take six or 700 groups around Europe on 35 different itineraries. You can and learn about that on our website or with our catalog about our tours. There's a hundred of us at Europe through the back door working really hard to design all this information. And then we've got a hundred guides in Europe working really hard to connect with our American travelers and making sure you enjoy maximum travel thrills for every mile, minute, and dollar on your next trip. There's 35 different itineraries in our, in our uh, selection. And uh, the one we've been talking about today is the best of Turkey in about two weeks. Once again, we started in Istanbul, and then we scooted on over to Anchor, the modern capital. We went then into the center of Turkey for Cappadocia, before dropping by Konya, the home of Mevlana, and the more conservative town, before going down to the south coast for a cruise on the Mediterranean, and then finishing off with the mineral springs at Pumakale, the great ancient sites of Aphrodisias and Ephesus, which is right next to the cruise port of Kusadasa. And from Kusadasa, it's very easy to hop over to the Greek islands and island hop back to Athens if you wanted to return from there. 
One way or another, Turkey is an important place to visit. It's not just a fun place. It's not just a tasty place. It's not just a cheap place. It's really important that Americans get a good look at a modern, secular, Western-looking Islamic nation. I hope this is interesting and helpful for your travels, and thank you very much. Happy travels. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.